and talk about another, uh, next slide, uh, okay, yeah, this one. Um, uh, talk about another one of the, uh, the great heretics of the second century as a guy named Montanus, uh, uh, who lived sometime in the mid to late second century. There are no dates associated with Montanus. Uh, other than he was condemned by multiple churches uh, in multiple geographic different locations in A.D. 177. Uh, so by then he was famous enough that his ideas had gone forth to a lot of different places, um, and he may or may not have been dead by then. Um, and it's not known how he died. Um, but Montanus was a guy from Phrygia, uh, in the northern part of what is now Turkey, um, northeast of where of the province of Asia, where Ephesus and the seven churches of Revelation are. Um, and apparently he was a fairly new believer. He might have been a pagan priest before he became a Christian. Um, uh, and he, among other things, proclaimed uh, that the town of Papuza in Phrygia was the new Jerusalem. It was the place that God was going to send down the new Jerusalem, that the hillside outside of Papuza was the place that God was going to do this thing. Um, so uh, that, that echoes Joseph Smith and uh, uh, Mormonism a little bit in my mind. Uh, he claimed uh, to be the prophetic heir to Agabus, uh, the prophet that you see in the book of Acts, and had an explanation of how uh, there was a descent from Agabus and the daughters of Philip that met in Montanus, that he was the prophetic descendant of both uh, of those, um, and uh, he, uh, he and his two priestesses, Priscilla and Maximilla, uh, 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 created a charismatic kind of a worship uh, that became fairly, profit, uh, fairly popular uh, and was known as the New Prophecy. Um, and people who uh, followed it called themselves adherents of the new prophecy. And so you see here in the bottom right, you've got uh, Montanus. Uh, this, is from, this is from the uh, facade of a church. And so here's uh, Montanus carved into it and his uh, sidekicks Priscilla and Maximilla here, both of whom are riding on lions uh, as a sign uh, of the presence of the devil. Um, uh, this is carved into the facade of a church uh, in Toulouse, France, uh, <clears throat> into the great basilica there. Um, so this is part of a relief around the entrance uh, and is uh, from sometime probably in the first decade of the 12th century, uh, very early 1100s, uh, carved out of white marble. Um, and uh, and so you've got on the facade of this church, you've got the apostles. And underneath the apostles, under their feet, and in this case, under the feet of the apostle James, you've got celebrated early heretics of the church under the feet of the apostles carved into the facade of the cathedral at Toulouse. And so here's Montanus with his two priestesses carved into the facade of a, of a cathedral under the feet of, uh, of the uh, Apostle James. Uh, so uh, anyway, so these are, uh, <clears throat> there are signs and symbols of uh, the focus on death here. Uh, uh, they, uh, this is carved to represent that these are people for whom death is not vanquished. Death has not been defeated for them. Uh, and so they are ag agents of death. Um, but uh, 
But Montanus believed in the use of women as public leaders in the church. He brought these two priestesses uh, who were apparently from a pagan temple kind of an arrangement in, with him into the church. Um, it does seem very much uh, to me here that the, uh, that the sculptor uh, that carved them uh, tried to make it look like they were wearing too much makeup. Um, that may just be me, but uh, it certainly seems to me that that's part of what he's at the sculptor is attempting to, uh, uh, to, to say here. Um, but, but Montanus believed in and preached the gospel of uh, ongoing revelation, that, uh, there was, that there should be a charismatic dependence on the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would seize control of people. Uh, he believed that, that when the Spirit spoke through people, those people were not touched by God and able to sit down and write, but that they were, uh, they were caught up in a, uh, a frenzy as they were possessed by God, where they no longer had any control of themselves, and where the things that they would say they had no control of because it was God speaking directly through them. Um, so, uh, so they didn't believe that they were messengers of God. They believed that they were uh, that God uh, embodied himself in them and took control of their lives. And this, this got some, uh, some traction partly because uh, of the way that John in his gospel talks about the coming of the Spirit, the paraclete, um, and, and the things that John wrote in his revelation. Uh, and so Montanus and kind of trying to build on that. Uh, uh, and he, uh, so he believed that the Holy Spirit speaks very directly. It's a very charismatic kind of worship. Uh, it's often compared today to certain kinds of Pentecostalism uh, and other kinds of very charismatic worship today. Um, but, uh, but he also talked about the need for a return to a simpler church, and by which he meant less focus on teaching and less focus on the scripture and more focus on uh, a rigorous asceticism, self-denial. Uh, uh, among other things, uh, he, uh, he preached that, uh, that if you uh, were widowed, uh, if, if the person that you were married to died, that it was, it was against the scripture to remarry, that you should be married once and that was it. Um, uh, he also preached that, uh, that once you were baptized, uh, you could no longer be forgiven for any sin. That if you fell from grace, that you could not be redeemed. And that therefore you needed to live in a constant state of grace and you needed to re live a super ascetic and controlled life that you might not cross into sin and be cast out of the church. Uh, he believed that there really shouldn't be any church hierarchy, any larger authority, uh, that there was no earthly authority over him, uh, that, you know, he said that the word of God was the only true authority, but he really focused on prophetic utterances. So he had women uh, as a result of his two priestesses. He, uh, he endorsed women serving as presbyters and deacons and other leaders of the church. Uh, and so people today often look at Montanus and Montanism as being very empowering of women. He also taught that, uh, that unmarried women should be veiled uh, and that women uh, should always dress very, very plainly and in ways that did not show anything about their shape. Um, so uh, he had very rigorous rules for women, even though he empowered certain of them as leaders in the church. And he's the first to actually provide regular salaries to the people that, uh, that went out preaching on his behalf. Um, so uh, he was building on, uh, Didache says that, you know, roving prophets are to be honored, and Montanus kind of can't ran with that uh, because his... Uh, his whole concept was, my people are prophetic, and when they come, they will speak to you the real words of God, and so you should be honored. And this remained a thing in the church up through the fourth century, and even as late as this early sixth century, uh, there are some uh, elements of Montanism in the church, but it also led to a huge 
uh, pushback, and that pushback was basically the discrediting of prophetic speech as a way of teaching the gospel and a focus on preaching instead. And so next time we'll start to look at some of the outcomes of that.